Hello, nobles. Today we're taking a look at how the earth kept evolving after humans came onto the scene. Now, if we look at this calendar, if you will, this is like a calendar view of the earth's history, starting all the way back when Thea crashed into the earth and it made the new earth with the moon attached to it, you know, spinning around it. So if you look here, uh, that day was like January 1st on the calendar, if you will. And then all of these geological and evolutionary milestones that occurred after that, all those eons and epochs and all of those eras, those are all being shown here. So we can see the, the oldest rocks. Well, what's a rock? Why, why didn't we have rocks before January 29th? Because the ball was all uh, the ball. The earth was a big ball of lava. So when it finally cooled down, we had to have the first rocks. And then we could finally start to have the first weathering and the first dirt. That would take forever. The oldest chemical evidence of life didn't happen until March 12th. So we talked about the biogeology, how the earth had to cool, how the atmosphere had to come to be. And then that affected the chemicals that could work in the liquid of the ocean and create the first cells. So there's the first cell, April Fool's Day of this evolutionary calendar. And then the first eukaryotic cell, that didn't happen all the way until August. That's like more than half of the year, right, in this scale. So let's jump past all of that and jump to when did humans arrive on the scene? When was there that speciation event that humans became a species? And it says right there, humans, homo sapiens, the humans that we know, those did not arrive until the last quarter second before, it says, oh, appears one hour before midnight, homo sapiens. And then the last quarter second, we landed on the moon. So in that one day, we had from the first Homo sapien until 1960s with the first moon landing. And so we're going to focus on that time today. And we're going to look at biogeology still. We're still looking at how the Earth evolved. But now we're going to look at humans. Now, let's say on December 31st, uh, humans were organisms. And they shifted from being an organism to being a society, and that has had the impact on the planet. So we're gonna start by talking about first, how did humans go from being an organism to a society? And has that changed the, the planet? Well, you might remember this graph. You notice that I've made a couple tweaks on it. You didn't see this yellow box before because I talked about the five mass extinctions before this last one that we are in right now. So there's a lot of scientists that call the current time the Holocene extinction or the extinction caused by man, right? So you might see this word anthropogenic. Anthropogenic means resulting from the influence of humans. So we are in this last time. Now, you notice, notice that there is numbers of organisms, there's still more and more organisms that are speciating, that are coming in to the picture, but there's also a mass uh, background extinctions that we haven't discussed. But will there be a mass extinction event like there were before where huge percentages of organisms are lost? That's, that's kind of the topic that we're going into today. And this lecture is going to bridge us from the end of the evolution unit into the last unit of the year, which is humans' role in maintaining the resources of this planet. So again, how did humans go from being an organism to being a society? We'll talk about the impact later. But let's talk about uh, how, the difference between organism and society. Well, when humans came about, they were like any other organism. They had their role. They had a niche. Right, And their niche was to go out and find food and hide from predators. It was well known that saber-toothed cats, Smilodon, 
these these cats used to eat humans. I mean, you know, big cats like saber tooth tiger, I guess is what people call them. But we were running away from big animals that try to eat us as well. And we started to form groups. And these groups, these these groups that lived in the Stone Age, uh, they were what we call hunter gatherers. They went out, they went looking for food. Some of them hunted. So there was the creation of spears, knives, even arrows and bows. And we were gathering food. And the problem with this method, right? So we're saying about 200 to 300,000 years ago, we, we speciated, right? Off of that lineage of, of great apes. And it took almost 100,000, 180,000 years before we had agriculture. So like for the first 180,000 years or so, we were strictly hunting and foraging. Some members of the group were out killing animals for us to eat. And some of us were out picking berries, finding leaves, finding roots. And again, these were the Stone Age humans who had tools that were good for that work. Now, I put here that it was boomer bust. <clears throat> they might kill a big animal and they would have way more food than could be eaten by the group. So they would try their best to eat as much as they could, put on some weight, and then that would help carry them through the lean time, right? So you might not eat every single day. You might be eating one day and not eat for three or four days because you are not gonna find another big animal to take down and share with your group. And of course you also had the fruits and roots and stuff that was being foraged as well. But of course, this cost a lot of calories. So even when there was food, food, it would take miles of walking to find it. So it would cost a lot of energy to the organism, to the body, to find food, to, to keep the organism alive. So it's kind of like you have to work to get the energy. You have to put in energy. And of course, you had to have the energy to not only keep staying alive, but to reproduce and take care of young ones who can't hunt or forage for themselves. So pre-agriculture, there couldn't have been many humans living in one area because of the carrying capacity. You might remember that concept when we talk about ecology, humans were limited to a carrying capacity. The land could only support so many of them because again, there was no food just there. They had to work so hard for it. So. Uh, scientists have calculated that for a hunter gather a group of 100 individuals, so let's say a group of 100, that sounds like a, a big number of people. It, it is, right? 100, let's say like three classrooms of people, There, you would need anywhere between 50 to 500 square kilometers, depending on where you live, right? So if you lived in the tropical rainforest, uh, 50 square kilometers was good enough for you to have uh, to find enough food for that many people. But if you live uh, somewhere like in the hotter parts of California, you might have to spread out a little bit, right? You couldn't be so close to other groups. So you could think already there's going to be a lot of competition here. So what changed? When did it change? So about 15,000 years ago, 15,000 years ago, there was a shift. There was something that happened that our ancestors started farming in a sense right and you can see this is a cool picture that shows some smoother stone <laughs> smoother stone tools that were used to farm and to slaughter animals right so the neolithic age that's what we call it the neolithic age right the stone age was the paleolithic age okay Paleolithic age. Uh, this is now the Neolithic age, and this is the farming age. So what happened here? So in the areas of Mesopotamia, China, South America, and Sub-Saharan Africa, this is where we have found fossils, uh, not only of, of humans, but also of their tools. 
And this is where we have our evidence that these are the first farms that were developed. Now you might be thinking uh, farms like we know them. No, no, not, not rows and rows and rows of corn, right? But we're talking about they found out which plants they liked and they tried their best to keep those plants in the area. Same thing with animals. Instead of walking miles to go try to find an animal to kill, they learn to keep the animals in a pen, right? So today's corn, pigs, cows, they don't look anything like what they had. They had the wild type. Remember that term from evolution, wild type. So wild type organisms are the ones that are, are found naturally, that were created by natural selection. But what we see today, right, when you look at a chicken today, that is created by artificial selection, right? And of course, the process of breeding, breeding organisms. Now, the main question, the big question always is like, how did we go? I mean, it only took 150,000 years, 180,000 years, but how did we go from organisms that didn't know how to farm? What turned on the light? We don't know. We don't know exactly, right? How or why? Some theories are that even though we look the same, uh, our brains changed a little bit. We, we might have had some mutations, some mutations that gave us the ability to come up with a thought and language, sharing history, sharing ideas with each other, and then maybe passing those ideas from generation to generation. Maybe somebody noticed that instead of eating all the seeds, if you let some of them go into the dirt, that you would get a new plant, right? And maybe they learned from there that they could plant seeds instead of cooking all the seeds at one time. But there's a, a big theory that says that the more and more food that we were able to harvest and eat that actually helped, helped feed our brains and made us a little bit more creative so that we can keep on thinking. So again, 15,000 years ago, there might have been the right mix of environmental and cultural development for there to be an agricultural revolution. Again, the smooth tools, that's what Neolithic means. So Paleolithic means rough stones and Neolithic means smoother stones. So that's why we have the Paleolithic, the Stone Age, and then the Neolithic, the smooth Stone Age. All right, so what were the results of agriculture? What happened once groups started to do this? Not just like groups of, <laughs> this is, might sound wrong, now, instead of like herds of humans, now we started to shift towards societies of humans. And I guess I'll, we'll, we'll jump way ahead, right? So the largest impact was on the population. All of a sudden, there was more food. The carrying capacity went up big time. The carrying capacity went up. So now in, a, in, that, in the same area you had before, now you could have a lot more people because there's a lot more food. As a matter of fact, remember I mentioned before that the carrying capacity for hunter-gatherers was limited to, you know, like the 500 square kilometers. Well, back then it was estimated that the Earth's human population was somewhere between six and 10 million people on the whole planet, only six to 10 million people. I think California has more people than that right now, right? But then after the agricultural revolution, right? In the Roman Empire, 10,000 years after the Neolithic era, we went from 10 million people to 250 million people. That sounds like a lot. It's not. That's less than the U.S. population. But within 10,000 years, 25 times. And then if you look at today, today we're 28 times, 28 times the Roman times. And we're at 7 billion people, 7 billion people on this planet right now. Why? Because agriculture has kept improving, improving, and improving. So how did it improve? Well, the, the more use of breeding, right? So we bred our plants, we bred our animals 
to make sure that we had increased availability of consumer consumable calories per kilometer. I like that phrase, consumable calories per, per kilometer. In other words, saying that in the same area, you have more plants and animals that you can actually eat than you did before. Like, look at this uh, Roman agriculture. Look at that. There's like a little castle fortified area back there. But then you got rows and rows and rows and rows of grapes. And you even have some changing in the land. You know, that took some people some time, right? Changing the land, changing the way water runs so that you can plant. Someone that figured out if we plant rows, we can walk through them and we can get the food better. We can run water better. Right? You've heard of the Roman aqueducts. This is the Byzantine Empire back in uh, what's now Turkey. Uh, you could see, you see all these houses? You see these Colosseums? How did we get to that, right? Well, when you replaced all the plants you don't need with the plants you want to eat, and you take advantage of irrigation, and maybe you get water to areas that you couldn't have water before, now you have all this food, now you have all these people. And if you have all these people, Guess what happens? There's some people who don't farm. Some people, they learn trades. They learn how to build a house. So maybe they tell the farmer, hey, uh, give me some food and I'll build your, your castle for you. Right? Or maybe they're good at making tools, better tools. Maybe instead of the Stone Age, we move into the Bronze Age. Right? Metal Age. So... Now we have skilled people trading their skills for food. And we have a trade system and we start to have, again, a society where it's not just uh, staying alive by gathering food, but staying alive by using your ideas and competing with ideas. And this led to better buildings, you know, better shelter. I mean, Colosseums, imagine doing that back then. Increased productivity, right? Led to creation, creativity, and eventually better weapons, rise of governments, and military. Why military? Well, guess what? If some group doesn't have all these crops that you have, maybe they want your crops, and maybe there'll be competition, just like in any other part, any other species on the planet, uh, humans weren't able to evolve away from competition. So society got big. We got up to you know, millions of people, then billions of people, and we invented society and kept advancing agriculture. So human as an organism or human as a society. Humans have become one of the most significant agents of change in the near surface earth system. So near the surface of the earth, where we live, where our feet touch, where our hands can touch, right? This, this part of the earth, if we're on the land, we're in the geosphere. If we're in the ocean, we're in the hydrosphere or in a lake, right? Or a river. But just because... We can, we can touch it doesn't mean that's the only spot that we're impacting because we know that all of these spheres are connected to each other. So if I drop something over here on the land, it might rain and it might end up in the ocean like a face mask. Ugh. Anyway, or some chemicals can get up into the sky. And like I said, this is a bridge from evolution to the next unit. So we'll be talking more about that as we go. But we have to remember that the activities and advanced technologies that have built and maintained human, human civilizations clearly have large consequences for the sustainability of these civilizations. What am I saying? That as time has gone on and people got better at building things, building skyscrapers, building better farms, feeding more people, making medicines for people to stay alive, making chemicals for the farm so that things are better, like fertilizers, right? What has that impacted in the rest of these spheres and in the ecosystems, right? Our ecosystems. 
as human populations grow, we have to consume. We need food. What was I talking about? Consumable calories. And consumable calories, how can we grow this stuff? We need resources, natural resources. So the more people there are, the more resources we need. And the longer we're around, humans have an impact on the planet. So let's go back to agriculture and the impacts of agriculture. So to expand the amount of usable land, farmers, agriculturalists, cleared forest using slash and burn technique. There's still humans that do this today. They cut, they chop into trees, not even cutting them down, like hack into trees, peel the tree, and then they burn uh, an area so that the tree will fall and all the shrubs will fall. And then that will become fertilizer for the ground. It's not the best fertilizer, but it is a fertilizer. And this technique has been used all the way back to the Romans and it's still used today. I've actually seen it myself driving down the five freeway past the farms. Sometimes they clear the last of the crop with a little controlled fire. Farming affects the quality, availability and distribution of water through the modifications of streams, lakes and groundwater. Think about this irrigation system that the Romans were creating to deliver water to places, right? So there's a stream, there was a lake somewhere and they built aqueducts and they got the water going perfectly to this area. Sounds good, right? So how, that's how you got your surface water. How about the water, groundwater? We have these things called wells, right? Someone learned to dig a hole to find patches of water and they can use a pump, a windmill to pull the water out of the ground. And this is, of course, how we started our mega farms. So again, messing with the ecosystems, taking the, taking the resources out of the ecosystems that the organisms that were there before the farms start to lose. Not only that, human activity has caused land erosion. So we talked about chemical weathering and wind and water weathering that breaks down rocks and minerals. Well, we also know that rocks and minerals and soil uh, is held down by plant roots. But once you start clearing the land, once you clear the land every season of your crop, you have loose dirt that can be carried away in erosion, right? The wind can carry it, the rain can carry it away. So humans have added a lot to the erosion factors, to that whole sedimentation, the sediments being deposited somewhere else, all of that has also been affected greatly by agriculture, which of course is feeding society. And maybe you might not think about it, uh, if, if we have this farm over here in this little spot and the dirt is loose and it rains and the dirt falls into the river, the river is gonna carry that sediment into the ocean and then now we're gonna have dirt in the ocean that might be affecting fish populations that those people use. What if people over here are surviving on fish and these people over here are surviving on corn? Now these people are being affected downriver from those because of the erosion. Herds of animals, they used to, right, go spread out looking for food. So let's say you had some wild buffalo and they're out there eating and moving along. But now humans have pushed them into one spot. So they're not herd animals leaving and walking away. Now they're eating in one area, again, overgrazing the land, taking out the plants, leaving bare dirt, again, leading to this evolution. Not only that, have we, <laughs> did we stop at having the organisms eat all the grass? No, we actually put them into buildings Right? We have chickens in coops and we have pigs in warehouses. Uh, we have maybe cows are the only ones that are still outside only because it'd be crazy to build structures big enough to hold cows. But when you have all these animals next to each other, guess what happens? Uh, you get disease, right? You get disease amongst the animals. 
So whatever disease hits one cow is going to hit the cow that's standing right next to it because it's right next to it, right? And we know, we've all learned it recently with COVID-19 that sometimes diseases can jump from animals to humans, from the humans that are around the animals all the time. So that's one of the theories for how COVID-19 uh, came, uh, that it came from bats, but uh, those bats were around animals and everybody's living on top of each other. So species density. I mean, just a simple fact that if you're around other humans, there's a chance that you might get sick if a human is sick next to you, right? So 7 billion people on the earth, we have a pretty high density. Now, let's look at these two pictures. Believe it or not, this is La Puente Valley in 1935. Here's Valley Boulevard. Here's Hacienda Boulevard. Here is what La Puente looked like in 1935. Before the houses were built, all of this area was citrus groves, citrus, oranges in particular. So here's another picture looking from Roland Heights at the same Azusa Canyon that we see today. And you can see right down the center right here, this is Azusa Avenue. It used to be a dirt road that went all the way down. And again, you see all of the citrus plants. Did it stay like this? No, it didn't stay like this. It changed to be what we know today, right? It changed to houses. Why? More food means more people. More people means more cities, more society. So check out this picture. This is from the U.S. Geological Service or USGS. So if you see USGS, U.S. Geological Survey. So this is funded by our government and it shows you the current usage of the land in the United States. It's pretty interesting. Now, green means forest. That's cool, right? Trees. All right. Yes, trees. Taking out the carbon dioxide. Awesome. Um, grasslands in that pink color. Grasslands. Ooh, Grasslands, grasslands, like, you know, what the deer and the buffalo and the antelope. There's a song where the deer and the antelope range. All right. So notice that uh, we don't have as many grasslands. And then we have shrubland, shrubland. So shrubland, notice where it's at. Uh, it's kind of like the deserty area. So like shrubs. So not, not great places to live and really not grasslands. Grasslands are like where the grazers like to eat. So now let's look at, uh, oh, you might be wondering, what are the red dots? The red dots are the urban areas, the urban areas, like where there's a lot of people, right? Kind of like where we're at, it's pretty urban, you know, downtown LA, obviously urban. So that's, those are the red clusters here. And of course there's humans amongst all of these areas, right? Some people live in near the grasslands, some people live in the shrublands, you know, like uh, out in the deserts. But look at the yellow. The yellow is the current American agricultural land. So all of the agricultural land, think about it. Why do we have crops there? Well, probably because there's like some resources there. Probably those are closer to grasslands that used to be where the deer and the antelope would range, right? So again, society has grown. So our need for food has grown. Well. Let's be honest. Does the United States eat all of the food that it grows? No, it doesn't. We actually send a lot of food out around the world as well, right? But that gets into this whole politics thing. So not only did humans grow agriculture, right? They also grew in breeding animals and they actually hunted a lot, right? Once rifles and those things were invented, uh, it wasn't hunting just because you needed to stay alive, but hunting for other things. You might be saying, what are these animals? These are called elephant seals, right? And this nice little picture shows you how big the elephant seal is uh, to a average, like, uh, let's say six foot man. So elephant seals are these big, big, big seals that fight like this. This is how the males fight. The, the males fight so that uh, they can, they, it's kind of like lions. You know, that the alpha lion beats off uh, all of the other lions so that only the alpha lion mates with the pride. The same thing. So the elephant seals, the winner gets to mate with all the females in that area. 
So you can see they fight. They have really big tusks right here on their jaw, and they hack each other's throats. Look at that. See the blood? All right. Now, why are these guys so interesting? Now, I was mentioning hunting, right? This is, uh, again, you couldn't take down these guys with an arrow. It'd be pretty hard, right? It'd be hard for humans to bum rush one of these guys because you can see it'd be a fight. If that's what they do to each other, imagine what they would do to a human being. Well, back in the 1900s, 1910, there was less than 100 elephant seals left. They, they say that it might have even gotten down to 20 to 30. 20 to 30 actual elephant seals left in the world. Oh, I forgot to say, they only live right here in uh, North America, swimming between like Northern California down to Mexico. And it was actually the Mexican government who protected them first. In Mexico, it was illegal to touch one of these guys. And now, I mean, shortly thereafter, California also made it illegal to touch elephant seals. So now wherever the elephant seals land on a beach, it's their beach. As a human, you're not allowed to go near them. You get a, get a hefty ticket. But why were we hunting? Well, why did we hunt? We we're hunting all kinds of animals, right? We hunted the buffalo almost to extinction, right? Because we wanted their furs. Uh, the elephant seals, their skin made really good waterproof tents. Their blubber made really good oil for lamps. And, of course, you could eat the meat. So human society has this thing where, you know, uh, we take full advantage of all of the, the organisms that are around us. In particular, I'm calling out the elephant seal because it led to what we call a bottleneck effect. We've actually talked about bottleneck effects before this is when a population gets knocked down so small in number that the gene pool gets restricted to a very small amount. So much so that today's elephant seals, not only because they were hunted down to like less than 100 animals, uh, and the fact that only one male gets to mate with all the females after he fights off the other guy, uh, Today's elephant seals are basically all cousins to each other. So you might be thinking, what does that mean? What do I mean? Genetically, it's like if they were all cousins. And why is this bad? Because if a disease comes by that affects one, it might knock out the rest of the population. And then that would be the final extinction of the elephant seal. That's why they are so protected here in California. All right, here's some other things to consider. So I, I mentioned hunting. Right. So let's look at California. And if you've ever flown over California, maybe you've seen this. Right. Here's a color picture of what I showed uh, of La Puente before. Here is what it looks like in California. And this is a great picture because you can see, look at look at how good we are at, like, cutting up the land. Nice little squares. This is owned by this guy. That's owned by some other guy. Right. <laughs> and they have their farms and nice, neat rows. And it's like, oh, that's not a perfect square. Oh, yeah, there's like a natural river running through there. All right, that's – what are you going to do, fill in the river? I mean, they could. Oh, okay, you guys see this right here? This is the California aqueduct, right? So we actually have from the Sacramento River all the way up in Sacramento, California, we have cut – oh, here's Sacramento. Okay. Uh, we are down here behind this picture. So Los Angeles is down here. So you see all this green patch right here? This is the California agriculture. So what we did was, like I said, the Sacramento River is up here, and we have made man-made rivers that run all the way down so that all of these all of these farmers can have the water they need to grow all of the crops. And if you're wondering why do we want all these crops, well, let's talk uh, dollars and cents here in California. In California, uh, 2014, these are the top 10 commodities. Commodities like humans making money, right? Look at that, milk, $9.4 billion California made in milk alone. And then, of course, that means cows. How many cows? Many, many cows. Look at that crazy picture. This is uh, off the 5 Freeway in the city of Coligna, California. I've actually driven past it. It really smells. Uh, you can see, look out there into the distance, all those little spots, those are cows, right? So yeah, we make tons of money on milk, almonds. I'm talking billions of dollars feeding the rest of the United States, 
but also feeding the world, right? Strawberries, meat for the cattle, right? And calves. Ask me about that later. All right, lettuce, walnuts, tomatoes, pistachios. All right, and hay. You might be thinking, wait, hay? Who eats hay? All the cows eat hay. So, yeah, that also makes money. And then let's look at a, a country. Look at this crazy number right here. So 318 million Americans in 2013. And this is how many chickens were eaten in one year. How many cattle were eaten? How many cows in total? How many turkeys were eaten? So feeding everyone takes a lot of land, a lot of resources. I think we're all getting the picture here. So all of this agriculture. So the cows and the plants and animals and the chickens, that's all this yellow area. So what organisms had to give up their space for us to get this space, right? By doing this, we've taken giant areas of land, giant areas of land, and we've knocked down the biodiversity. There's a big word that we need to remember. So biodiversity was like how many different types of species are in the area. In some of these areas, the species is down to cows, pigs, and chickens, no other species. Oh, yeah, and humans that are, are taking care and uh, eating all those animals, as opposed to all of the natural animals that should be there in those same areas. But not only that, as I mentioned before, humans have this thing about getting smarter and smarter and making more and better technology. And part of the technology uh, is pesticides. Maybe like pesticides. Yeah, pesticides. Uh, you know, the, the sprays that they put on plants so that the bugs, the pests, don't eat the plants. So, yeah, for a long time we were doing that. And there was a very bad pesticide called DDT. DDT. And it was really bad because it was actually making it difficult, making the shells of the eggs of birds weak. So that when the birds sat on the eggs, the eggs would break. Imagine uh, one of the biggest uh, effects was on the condor, the California condor, which is our, not our state bird. It was like super important when I was in uh, elementary through high school, all I heard about was the California condor. Uh, the state bird is the quail, but the condor was almost extinct. So why why did that happen well today you are actually you'll see condors that are labeled like this all of them are tagged all of them are being tracked because we're still trying to get them off of the they're they're off the endangered species list but we want to make sure that they have enough organisms to reproduce and come fully back and you might be saying why do i care about this bird well this bird is uh one of those animals kind of like a vulture that they help clean up the environment right they help with that whole nutrient cycle. So how did that happen with the pesticides? Well, uh, DDT was not only found in crops, but it was also found in people's gardens because people were like, I don't like the bugs eating my roses or eating my tomatoes or eating whatever flower I'm growing. So people were using it, everyone was using it, golf courses were using it. And when it rained, the Pesticides would run down with the runoff, end up in the ocean, right? End up in fish, and birds might eat fish, or it would run off into different ecosystems where insects or other animals would eat it, and then it would be in their bodies, and it would be picked up by these bigger birds as well. So you can see here, Pesticides were being moved all throughout the different spheres, the hydrosphere into the water, the geosphere, the pesticides got down into our dirt, the atmosphere, uh, you know, when you're spraying pesticides, it's in the air it, and it could just stay in the air. It doesn't have to land on the ground, right? Some of it stays in the air. So, of course, we know that it could move. Now, the worst part for us uh, humans right, is that it was also running into our groundwater, right? And our groundwater is where we have our wells, where we get our drinking water, 
most of us, a lot of us, not just from the Sacramento River, let's say in California. Here's a interesting picture. Okay, so here again, here's the groundwater I was talking about. So whenever we have pesticides or any other chemical, it can come down into our groundwater and our wells can pick it up. So we can keep moving the these chemicals around in our food and in our own drinking water. And here's an interesting map again. This one also from the USGS showing where people might get contaminated drinking water uh, in this case of a, of a chemical called nitrate type of nitrogen that's found in fertilizers and fertilizers by themselves uh, are used of course to help the plants grow hey notice that the high areas are in the same kind of areas where we were talking about where the agriculture is well yeah you're going to use fertilizers where you have the crops okay let's watch another let's watch a little video here about the same kind of concept about fertilizers and runoff but in the early 2000s large algal blooms started to reappear with the worst on record occurring in 2011. for jeff reuter director of the ohio sea grant college and stone lab at the ohio state university that algae bloom was like nothing he'd seen before the bloom in 2011 really got everybody's attention. That bloom was two and a half times worse than anything we'd ever seen before. And it was really a bloom like I'd never experienced. And I've been working on Lake Erie since 71. And I've seen these before, but I'd never seen a bloom that when you hit it with a boat, it actually slowed you down. It was that dense. He believes that bloom and others like it are caused by excess potassium, nitrogen, and other byproducts of fertilizer runoff from the farms and towns that surround Lake Erie. The algae are very much like the grass on our lawns. You know, you put fertilizer on it, it's gonna have nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. It's gonna make your grass grow. We put it in Lake Erie and we get algae. Reuter says those ingredients can be coming from a variety of sources. When we look at different places around the country where they're having harmful algal blooms, some of them are going to be driven by agricultural loading but some of them are going to be poor sewage treatment plants or a bunch of failing septic tanks. But in Lake Erie, it's primarily agriculture. And climate change is proving to be an aggravating factor. Most of the phosphorus that comes into the lake, probably over 80% comes in during storms. Climate change leads to more frequent severe storms. And if we have most of the phosphorus coming in from agricultural runoff, combined sewer overflows, uh, runoff off our lawns, if most of that's coming in during storm events and you have more storm events, you're simply going to get more phosphorus. It's that simple. And more phosphorus encourages the growth of a form of algae known as cyanobacteria. It produces microcystin, the main toxin of concern on Lake Erie. And although Toledo's recent bloom was actually quite small, the densest portion of the harmful algae clustered right over the intake for the city's water treatment plant turning the tap water toxic. Justin Chaffin, research coordinator at the Stone Lab, tests samples from surrounding water treatment facilities to monitor whether the water is safe for drinking. If you look at some of your known toxins that you're familiar with, microcystin is about on par being, being toxicity with, with something like cyanide, or and it's just below, just below dioxin. So it's a, it's a really potent toxin. The United States has no national standard for these toxins, but Ohio has adopted the standards of the World Health Organization, which recommends one part per billion for drinking water. On August 2nd, 2014, the toxin levels in Toledo's water came in at three parts per billion. Yet the most alarming aspect of that toxic bloom is that it arrived in early August. It was much earlier than we had anticipated seeing a really bad bloom. Scary for all of us because we know that this bloom is going to stay around here until well into October, maybe the end of October, and it probably won't reach its peak until September. All right, so here we go again. So the, the same runoff that's causing the pesticides to spread out across the land and into the oceans uh, is the same kind of runoff that's carrying these fertilizers into the ocean. Now you might be wondering, what is this algae? Well, it's actually a very important algae that we've talked about in the past, cyanobacteria, green-blue algae. 
This is the algae that made the oxygen for the planet way back in the creation, like I mentioned of um, the first rock, land, the first oceans, right? It, so these cyanobacteria have been around since the beginning. And now they're poisoning our drinking water. That sounds bad, but look at what's worse. Look at that. You think fish can live in this poisonous water, right? So one of the byproducts of their photosynthesis is this chemical that's as bad as cyanide. And you might be wondering, so yeah, we'll fix it. This little problem, this one problem in this one lake uh, cost $12 million, $12 million to treat. The U.S. government spent $12 million. That means uh, the U.S. government used our tax money to fix this one problem. Imagine all the other problems. Now, they mentioned also uh, global climate change or the greenhouse effect. Now, the greenhouse effect is, again, going back to biogeology, the reason that we have life on this planet. We have carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the air. They help trap the heat that is coming off of the earth and make the earth the right temperature for the chemicals to move around. It's true. I like to say that these greenhouse gases, uh, I like this analogy, it's like a heat trapping blanket. You know what a blanket helps you like stay warm at night, helps trap the heat that's leaving your body. Now, what happens when you get too hot? You can always remove, you know, the blanket or use thinner blankets. Well, our earth is surrounded by this heat trapping blanket and uh, we're only adding to that blanket at the moment. We're trying to, you know, stop that. Uh, of the greenhouse gases, of the greenhouse gases, 14% come from transportation, 37% come from energy, and 21% come from our agriculture. And you might be thinking, wait, we're planting a bunch of plants. Shouldn't that reduce the greenhouse gases? Well, uh, all these machines that help us grow the plants and then move the food everywhere, yeah, keep the cows, you know, move the cows, all of that stuff, move the hay to the cow, all that stuff is also producing greenhouse gases. Now, here's a, a kind of random picture. I, I took these pictures actually. So right here in the hills of Roland Heights, which is not too far, if you look south, if you look north, you see the Azusa Mountains. If you look south, you see uh, the Roland Hills. And you might notice that we have built these gigantic, gigantic, um, towers, electrical towers. Turns out I was actually walking past these guys that were working it uh, one day and I asked them, why are these towers so big, right? Are we replacing the other tower? And they're like, no, no, actually the other towers are staying and these new towers, they actually carry three times as much electricity as this other tower. And I said, wait, why are we adding it? Well, more and more people are moving out to the desert. San Bernardino, Rialto, Apple Valley, Victorville, all the way out to Vegas. Here in California, they need electricity, you know, so they can run their Wi-Fi and charge their cell phones. So the more electricity that we need as society keeps increasing, you know, these laptops that we're all studying from, that's all going to require more electricity. That's only going to add to the amount of energy being made. And of course, that adds to the heat trapping blanket. Here's a sad picture. All right. Here is another uh, picture. This one, again, is from the U.S. Department of Energy, as well as the United Nations, or sorry, the United Kingdom. Uh, both of these uh, gave data to show this. So this shows back in 1850s. 1850s is back during uh, the Industrial Revolution. So, you know, humans were in a society for a while, but started making uh, these coal burning factories and then machines, steam powered machines. And notice what has happened to the average temperature of the planet over time. So they have average land temperatures and average ocean temperatures. And you can see in the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, 2010, and they only have one for 2020. So we'll see where this data goes. Again, 
This is setting you up for what our next unit is going to be about. The USGS says that these are the things that we have to look out for. I've already talked about a lot of these, habitat fragmentation, meaning like where's the land for the animals, water demands for agriculture. So go ahead and read through these again. But this is these are the things we should be looking out for and trying to fix in our agricultural practices. But one of them that I didn't mention, I did mention that we don't have uh, plants and animals that come from natural selection. Well, not only do we have artificial selection, but we also have genetically engineered selection, right? Now, so this is right here, this picture, see on the left? This is the first uh, crop, the first corn plant. The original corn plant looks like this, looks like a seed. And then these are the corn that we know today, right? So yeah, there's been some selective breeding and there's been some manipulation of genes. And over here, check these out. Cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower, they all come from the same wild mustard plant, except that we only selected for mutants that had different parts of the plant grow bigger or smaller. So here we are again. Humans started as an organism on the last day of the evolution of the Earth calendar and are affecting the biogeology, affecting the Earth's evolution. Have we, are we set up for another mass extinction? That's kind of the question that we'll be looking at in the next unit. Again, the end of the Halocene time point here on the map. But hey, let's just uh, look at what La Puente used to be and think about where we want to head as a society.